Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Andy Linehan, president of the club. Welcome to City Club and today's State of the Region Friday Forum titled Beyond 19th Century Government with David Bragdon, president of Metro. Uh, before we begin our program, I've our, I have our usual items of City Club business. Next Friday, February 20th, City Club concludes our Keeping Oregon's Promise series and for that event, we'll have Matt Hennessy, who's chairman of the Portland Development Commission. He's a charismatic speaker who will challenge us to put into action some of the ideas that we discussed during that forum or during that series. You can make your reservations online today at www.pdxcityclub.org. On March 5th, Governor Ted Kulingowski will deliver his State of the State uh, speech at City Club's Friday Forum. Uh, as you may recall, he had originally been scheduled for today. He had to reschedule, and we've only in the last week to discover that the reason he had to reschedule, of course, that he was in Iraq. But in any, in any event, uh, March 5th, he'll be uh, speaking before us at the Governor Hotel. There are no more luncheon tickets available. We've sold those out. Uh, there will also be no coffee table tickets, but there may be a small amount of general, uh, general seating available. And if uh, you can also put your name on a uh, standby list in case any reservations are canceled at the last minute. If you already have a reservation, we encourage you to prepay so that you won't have to stand in line during the event. Uh, we can go ahead and send you those tickets if you've prepaid. The City Club of Portland continues to bring you constructive and insightful programs and research vital to the well-being of our city and the region. But to sustain this long-term public dialogue, we need your help. Please consider a gift to City Club's annual fund. You'll find envelopes on each table, or you can contribute online. It's really easy to make a difference, and we look forward to your help. I wanted to tell you that the Friday 18th deadline is approaching for you to submit uh, suggestions for research and program programming topics. This is in what we're calling our community scan, which is an outreach to members of the club and to the community about ideas that uh, City Club should investigate for uh, research or programs. Uh, there are suggestion cards on your table, or you can submit ideas on the, on the City Club website. I'd also like to remind you that City Club has copies of today's program on audio C CD and videotape available for purchase. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Pacificor, CH2M Hill, and Schwabe Williamson and Wyatt. We're very grateful for their support. So on to our program. The recent past, and particularly the last couple weeks with the defeat of Ballot Measure 30, have hardly been the best of times for Oregon governments. Rather than the innovation and pioneering can-do attitude that Oregon has always shown to the world, more recently, fatigue and disillusionment have seemed to characterize many Oregonians' views of their governments. Today, David Bragdon, president of one of, an, uh, one of Oregon's most celebrated government innovations, will talk with us about the challenges facing our local and regional governments as they try to address our urban region in a new world economy. David Bragdon was first elected to the Metro Council in 1998, and he served two consecutive terms or two consecutive years as its presiding officer. David Bragdon became Metro's first president on January 6, 2003. Prior to being elected to Metro Council, Bragdon spent much of his career in the private sector with Oregon-based companies Nike, Lasco Shipping Company, and Evergreen Airlines. He also spent five years as marketing manager of the Port of Portland. David grew up in Portland and graduated, graduated from Catlin Gable High School. He graduated from Harvard University in 1982 with an honors degree in government. Welcome, David. Thanks, Andy. I, I wanted to take a minute first and introduce uh, some of my colleagues who are here from the Metro Council. We have Councilor Brian Newman and Councilor Rex Burkholder, Councilor Susan McLean are here. Our auditor, Alexis Dow, our Chief Operating Officer, Mike Jordan. I really appreciate working with all of them. And our former colleague, uh, Councilor, former Councilor Ed Washington. Pleasure to have you here. I'm also very flattered that uh, the mayor took time out of her day to be here. We work together very closely. She has a great interest in planning. Of course, you know I'm talking about her, the mayor of Oregon City, Alice Norris. Thank you for being here. And if we go down the path of introducing elected officials, uh, we'll spend a lot of time, but it's worth doing, I think, because I appreciate working with officials around the region. Chair Tom Bryan from Washington County, his colleague, Commissioner John Leeper, are both here. We have a quorum of the Lake Oswego City Council. Uh, I see Gay Graham and Carl Rohde and John Turchie, Jack Hoffman. 
uh, Commissioner Rojo de Steffi from Multnomah County, and Commissioner Eric Sten from the, uh, you're from, which, you're Troutdale, right? <laughs> yeah. So thank, thank you all. Thank you all for being here. As, as for the rest of you who are not elected officials, I do understand why we have a big crowd today, and some of you are out, up, not up to date on your city club newsletters, and you were expecting that the governor would be here speaking today. And uh, I, was, I was called two weeks ago to pinch hit, and the I was given the same explanation that you all were. So you can imagine I then wake up Wednesday of this week and read the Oregonian, and it does say that this trip to Iraq delayed Kulangoski's scheduled State of the State address and went on to say the governor's office explained late last week that it was because the governor would be in Kentucky. <laughs> so I, I, I keep reading, I keep reading, it says, quote, I did lie to people internally, said, <laughs> said Kulangoski's chief of staff, Peter <coughs> Bragdon. <laughs> I lied because I needed to do that, unquote. <laughs> so, so here I am, I'm a second choice chump. I have relatives who are self-confessed liars. And uh, <laughs> what can I say? I'm very happy to be here. I have uh, just started my sophomore year as president of the Metro Council. And as starting my sophomore year as president of the Metro Council, I also was thinking about my sophomore year in college. And one of the classes that sticks in my mind was a class about intergovernmental relations and the federalism in the United States. It's a fairly dry topic, but it was very animated by a professor who had been a junior member of the Brain Trust for President Franklin Roosevelt uh, during the Great Depression. One of the things he enjoyed most was talking about past times in American history when crisis really forced us to transform our expectations of government and our, our uh, visions and expectations for the things that government can do. And one, of the, one of the readings that we had in that course was an obscure book written in 1909. And I know it's obscure because last weekend, Powell's only had one copy of it. It was in the, in the warehouse on Quimby Street. It's a book from 1909 titled, a very noble title, entitled The Promise of American Life. It's written by somebody named Herbert Crowley, who nobody's heard of anymore, but he was the first editor of the New Republic magazine. He's now largely forgotten. He's, uh, I think, seen as sort of an eccentric idealist. He's most known for he had some incidental influences on Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. The intriguing thing about that book to me, even today, is really is a relic of how another progressive generation tried to grapple with challenges that are pretty similar to some of the ones that we're facing today. There are parallels between the time that Herbert Crowley wrote The Promise of American Life and our own. As is the case today, Americans at that time had a subconscious that was very imprinted with that folklore of, that really glorifies individualism, yet they were also at a period in history that were very unsettled by the modernizing world in which a, 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 the unbridled laissez-faire really threatened to reduce individual choices, not add to individual choices. And then, as now, democracy was really tested. It was being stressed with unprecedented economic changes and social dislocations. But he observed that amid all these other changes in society and in business, the debates about government that were going on were still bounded by two opposing paradigms that were, had been established more than a century before by Jefferson and Hamilton. And he warned that the promise of American life, the title of his book, couldn't be achieved without updating those outmoded paradigms, those terms of reference, by drawing on the best part of each of those legacies, but discarding those aspects that weren't serving anymore. Neither Jefferson's idealistic agrarianism or Hamilton's notions about a merchant aristocracy really were adequate to deal with the political forces of a modernizing and industrializing economy. American society and economics had changed quite a bit but political practice and government had not. So now is this starting to sound a little bit familiar? Achieving the promise of American life at that time required that government needed to change. Now, in that era, the Roosevelts, the Wilsons of that era did rise to the occasion. 
and the body politic possessed both that needed continuity of values as well as the adaptability of institutions to create what came to be known as the American century. And the result was decades of prosperity and a quality of life. It was the envy of the rest of the world because of decisions that they made at that time. Well, today, I find that we're in a similar sort of predicament, that American notions of individuality on one hand and notions of community on the other hand really are diverging. Economic conditions are changing faster and faster with structural changes. But at the same time, our government structures and a lot of our political debate sometimes seems like it's mired in a, in a distant and irrelevant era. Closer to home, the promise of Oregon life has always been sort of a quirky variant of that national impulse. And in many respects, though, it was the best blend. The promise of Oregon life was really about having it all. And not just having it all in terms of material wealth, though, of course, that was very important, too. It was also about having it all, the whole package, which included civic wealth, which included natural wealth. And people who came here and people who lived here had an ethic and an attitude that in Oregon, unlike in many of the other places where we had come from or our parents or ancestors had come from, here we really could have it all. That we could have a vibrant economy and new economic opportunities while also honoring the natural surroundings around us. That we could have, we could have a lifestyle in vibrant cities and towns while being surrounded by an economically viable rural countryside that's part of the same state. We could have it all. We could be proud of a responsive and innovative public sector while we were also growing a private sector that was notable for its progressive leadership and its inventive workforce. We could have all of those things. And for many, many years, leaders and citizens in this community made conscious choices to reinforce that promise. And many of you in this room made a lot of those choices and can take credit for bringing us all the results of the past that we're living off of today. You know what those are. In the Portland region, we revitalized old neighborhoods rather than throwing them away the way they do in other parts of the country. We preserved agricultural production rather than paving it over. In the 1990s, the Hillsborough area attracted more high technology investment per capita than any other place on the planet. Tremendous accomplishment in part due to the planning that the Hillsborough community did. We built light rail. We set aside 8,000 acres of green spaces. Again, decisions that we made. We also involved citizens in thousands of debates, and sometimes it seems like hours and hours and hours of debates. But those debates collectively convinced all of us that the future was something we could consciously shape together, rather than just letting it be something that happened to us. By making decisions in that way, we really did create shared memories and we created shared expectations about what is possible, how we relate to each other, and how we relate to the world around us. And the, the results of those choices are obvious to us today. They're all around us. The results are obvious in the landscapes that we have. The results are in our statute books. The results are also in our hearts when we talk about what this place means. But in more recent times, now we have this nagging suspicion that maybe, after all, we can't fulfill the Oregon promise. And familiar landscapes are starting to look a little unfamiliar. Schools are in decline. The physical infrastructure, the social support services are wearing thin. And as we look around, the and we struggle, we struggle economically. And as we look around at those issues, we also have lost confidence that government can actually address them and solve problems in a meaningful way. It's a very, very strange place for Oregonians to be, for Oregonians to find themselves in the very unfamiliar and unsettling position 
of wondering how and whether, whether we're going to redeem these promises that we made to each other and that we fulfilled for a long time. Well, I know that, that we can. not I know that we can do that. I also know, frankly, that doing so now is going to be hard work because it's no longer a matter of nostalgia or hoping that past leaders will be reincarnated and come back to some good old days that really are gone. Redeeming these promises now is going to require really restating the promise, reclaiming it. And it also means reevaluating old institutions in light of new conditions, in light of modern conditions. And one of those new conditions is that we now live in a world where, as many economists will tell you, the relevant geographic and globally competitive unit, it's not the city anymore. And it's not the state. And it's not the individual suburb. It's all of those things. It's the city region, a metropolitan region. That's the unit of measure in the world today. That is the evolution, probably more than any of the other changes going on in the world, that really drives the imperative for reform in Oregon's land use planning system, as well as in our decision making here in the region, this most populous region of the state by far. Oregon's land use laws have been on the books for 30 years, and the Metro Council has existed for nearly 25 years. And a tremendous amount has been accomplished in that time. But if we're going to continue to accomplish things, and if we're going to move forward into the future, then the agency that I lead and the state laws that I implement will need to be profoundly different in the next 30 years than they were in the past 30 years. That's a scary thing for people on all sides of this debate. But it does need to change. The last 30 years were different from the next 30 years. It needs to change in three specific ways. The first 30 years really were about planning. The next 30 years need to be about investment. The first 30 years were mostly really about urban containment and limiting the geographic extent of cities. And the next 30 years need to be about urban transformation and making cities great places. The first 30 years were about process and about procedures, all important things. But the next 30 years also need to be about outcomes and results, making institutions work, crossing anachronistic boundaries. So let's start the new era. Let's start the new era today with the, fir with the first question, what makes for a lively city region? It's remarkable in the, in the most stirring gubernatorial and legislative debates about Oregon land use planning back at the origins in the 1970s. This basic question, what makes a lively city region work, is remarkably unasked. That question was not asked at the time. Urban areas were really only mentioned in passing and only with sort of a negative implication as if cities, places that people live, there was a negative implication, as if they were like Dickens, London. They were evil places, some place that bucolic Oregon needed to be protected from. And the 30-second soundbite about Oregon land use planning, uh, whether in national clippings or in the, probably in the minds of most Oregonians, was that it was designed to protect farmland and forest land. Period. End of soundbite. And planning was, was rarely, if ever, described as also as a means for building great cities. And protecting farmland is a very important goal. That's an admirable thing to do. I think the fertile soils of the Willamette Valley or the Hood River Valley, they will silently attest to the importance that those areas have been protected by uh, curbing the geographic extent of suburban settlement. But containing suburban settlement alone, urban settlement alone, didn't alter the design and the style of the human environment for those of us inside urban growth boundaries. And many of those areas continued to be as ugly and dysfunctional, frankly, as some other parts of the US. So to start our reform of the land use system, we really need to start with a new conception of the city region as a good, 
something to be nurtured rather than as something bad to be contained. And that's a fundamental change in our mindset, a fundamental change in objectives. It also means making cities really good. As a new starting point for our state laws and for our regional policies, we really need to understand a whole lot better how to cultivate the qualities that make city regions thrive, economically thrive, socially thrive, environmentally thrive, on the ground for real people in the real world. We know what those elements are that we need to cultivate. We know what those elements are. It starts with an educated and inventive citizenry interacting with one another to create wealth and create jobs. It's the ability for people to get around, something interesting to do on Friday night culturally, beautiful place to go hiking among nature on Saturday afternoon. It's a reasonably priced government that delivers value for the tax dollar. Ultimately, a really an authentic sense of place. Those are the elements that will make for a thriving city region. And some communities in our region certainly do recognize those elements. Enjoying the revitalization of downtown Lake Oswego. And I was going to use this example before, their, before four of their city councilors showed up to hear me say it. But the revitalization of downtown Lake Oswego, we could also use Orenco and Hillsborough or Fairview Village uh, as examples. In all of those cases, people are noticing something important. They're noticing that regional planning no longer needs to be driven just about fearing what we don't want, sprawl, but can also be driven by the things we do want. Great urban and suburban places, the types of places that Jane Jacobs describes as socially vital and econo economically prosperous. So if our first step is to restate that goal, goal number, as the attainment of the lively city region, not merely the containment of it, then we have to make a second major shift, second major shift in how we approach planning for the future. And that is, if the first 30 years were about planning, the next 30 need to be about investment, private and public, and an understanding of how they interact. Today, the land use system that we have, we rely on an increasingly complex and very intricate web of legalistic regulations to administer our land use system. And while we're discovering that regulations may be an effective way and are an effective way to prevent bad things from happening, regulation by itself is not a guarantee that good things do happen. Causing something good to happen usually requires that somebody, somewhere, someone with a sense of a marketplace is putting money into something. And simply drawing pictures of what planners hope the world might be like in the world 2040 is insufficient. All too often, those of us in the public sector do confuse the menu with the meal. The Portland downtown plan, uh, the 1970s, it's legendary. But what's more than legend is the bricks and mortar investment, as well as the green and leafy investment that went into that area. That is what really brings that plan to life every day of the week, decades, decades later. And without private investors like Nordstrom, like John Russell, like the NATO family, without that, the downtown plan that it is so legendary in our community now really never would have been anything other than a plan. And without public investment, Waterfront Park, like the Performing Arts Center, like the Transit Mall. Without those investments, that plan would be forgotten and on a, get, on a shelf gathering dust someplace. And right now, to be brutally honest, the Metro Council's famous 2040 plan could be headed to that same type of unfulfilled fate because it has a lack of relationship to the private investment climate, and it's not tied to a public investment strategy. It is happening in some places. And in those visionary ju jurisdictions, 
that recognize that good planning is useless without good investment, they really get it. And private investors risking their capital, like uh, Cliff Kohler, who's renovating buildings in downtown Gresham, gets it. Barry Kane, who just opened the Lakeview Village on the lakefront in downtown Lake Oswego, a collection of stores and condominiums, he gets it. They also get that the city of Gresham's decision 10 years ago, their calculated investment in the street and road access to reach that downtown, and that the city of Lake Oswego's visionary decision to pr pr in in install a waterfront esplanade were public dollars that attracted those private dollars. And the mayors and city councils in Gresham and the mayor, Mayor Judy Hammerstad and her colleagues who are here from Lake Oswego, they also get it. They understand how to use public dollars wisely to leverage those private ones. But to make the most use of that leverage, land use planning in Oregon needs to change. And it needs to change in two pretty basic ways. First is that those of us in government need to maybe put aside for a minute the zoning crayons and pick up some of the tools of the marketplace and understand those tools that create a climate where private investment does lead to investments that make the lively region city thrive. And secondly, when we're spending tax dollars, particularly on infrastructure, which is the proper province of the public sector, we should do so in ways that optimize private investment that makes great places for people to live and work. Now, the question isn't whether government's going to intervene in the economy and shape the landscape. The fact is the government has been shaping development and investment patterns for centuries. It's just we've been doing it often in ways that are implicit, often unstated. Tax and expenditure policies ranging all the way from federal level, uh, from national policies that subsidize fossil fuels, including, I might add, multi-billion dollar wars in the Middle East to protect the oil supply, right down to school district deciding decisions that where they're citing schools without second stories, and without bike paths for the kids to get there. So government's involved in all of these decisions that shape the landscape already. I always find it very ironic when the critics of smart growth will claim that you know, building sidewalks or encouraging lofts above stores is some type of, of government-controlled social engineering, whereas uh, paving a, a, an eight-lane highway through somebody's house is, is somehow the invisible hand of Adam Smith and <laughs> magical. You know, it's a, a mythical free market did that. The uh, fact is all of those government actions do shape uh, the world around us. And the question is whether we're going to start shaping it consciously in ways that produce great places or whether we keep shaping it in ways that inadvertently create non-places. But because Oregon's planning system is not linked to any understanding of investment markets and not clearly tied to any public expenditure or fiscal strategy, it's as if we've been driving with our foot on the regulatory brake in one sense while having the other foot on the sprawl accelerator at the very same time. Let me give you some examples. On the fiscal side, we have inner ring suburbs unable to keep up, keep pace with their basic service and infrastructure needs, while at the same time our, their sister jurisdictions at the edge jockey to have land added to the urban growth boundary, partly because new industrial land is the only way for them to stabilize their tax base under Oregon's crazy quilt property tax and municipal finance system, self-inflicted by the initiative process. On the investment side, for example, we have a state department of transportation that designed Highway 99W to obliterate downtown Tigard and designed Highway 99E to obliterate downtown Milwaukee. When even though those, those communities' private property values would be enhanced with the appropriate road access and a well-designed main street. On the tax, taxation side, we penalize people for improving 
their property and improving an at ten story building and implicitly that's encouraging another property owner to hold a vacant lot vacant forever now those financial policies are not going to build a great city region nor are we going to build a great city region or for that matter are we going to have a just society by following the opposing philosophy of a so-called property rights or confusing speculative real estate development with true wealth creating economic development They're not the same thing so finally if if the role of government is to attract and to grow the financial and natural and human capital investment to make the lively city re city region thrive then how does our approach to governance also need to change over 30 years our system has increasingly focused on procedures rather than outcomes the menu it's not the meal all too often, I find myself basing my decisions on questions like, will my decision be overturned by the Court of Appeals? Instead of basing my decisions on questions I'd rather be asking myself, such as, will my decision make the world a better place for my constituents? And I'm sure all the people on the Court of Appeals are, are very nice people. <laughs> That's not what I meant. What I meant was, I'm not sure they went to law school because they have an aptitude for what makes a complex city, metropolitan region, really tick. And if that were the question, rather than asking them, I'd rather ra ask an architect. I'd rather ask a cab driver. I'd rather ask my 11-year-old nephew or my 9-year-old niece who are here because those are the people who know what are going to make a lively city region tick. Instead, our emphasis on legal procedures rather on, than on the results of the procedures themselves, it's really the hallmark of a system in which nobody trusts anybody anymore. Nobody trusts that the system can be administered with common sense and discretion. So we've taken qualitative measures out of a discipline, planning, that by nature should be very, very qualitative. Well, just as Herbert Crowley said that Theodore Roosevelt could not solve 20th century challenges with 18th century ideologies, we also need to recognize that we can't solve 21st century challenges with 19th century institutions. And most of the challenges of the 21st century really are regional, in that they're not confined by the artificial city and county boundaries that were drawn back in the horse and buggy era. Because it is the region, not the city, not the state, that's the competitive economic unit in the world today. We talk about the research triangle, not Raleigh or Durham. We talk about Silicon Valley, not San Jose and Santa Clara. It's the Pearl River Delta, it's not just Kowloon and Shenzhen. Outsiders, whether they want to advertise toothpaste to the consumers in our regional marketplace or whether they want to locate a high-tech plant, look at us as a region. They don't look at us as a collection of jurisdictions. It's a regional labor market. It's a regional transportation grid. It's a regional air shed. It's a regional, wa many regional watersheds. It's a regional economy. And Hillsborough's health is tied to Beaverton's health. And Beaverton's health is tied to Tigard's and so on down the line. People live in one city and work in another. They attend the ballet in one county, then deliver their kids to soccer in another county, 10, minutes, 10 minute drive away. The rest of the world knows these lines really don't matter anymore. Regular people know. These lines don't matter in their everyday life. But the only unit of government that can really represent the practical truth of this natural economic interdependence is a regionally elected one, the Metro Council. 
having spent most of my career in the, much of my career now in the private sector, I'm amazed at the increasing pace of change in the private sector and the nonprofit sector for that matter. Yet by contrast, the lack of change in our public ones. And if you think for a minute about the change in our non-governmental organization in our society, and how much they have changed, Nike's organization today does not look like Converse's organization in the 1950s. Tektronics doesn't operate now the way it did in the 1950s. The Portland Art Museum is not run now the way it was in the 1950s. Yet local government in the United States of America looks pretty much like it did in the 50s, actually the 1850s. <laughs> and think, ask yourself, what if we told Boeing or IBM or told the New York Yankees, we want you to get out there and provide the best service you can and compete today, but you're only going to be allowed to use the methods and the organization that you used in the 1950s. How would those organizations do? Yet that's what we're asking government to do. Americans are the most innovative people on the face of the planet, but we often come to a creative block when it comes to local government and delivering these services, despite all these other changes going on around us and in other parts of the world. The line between Germany and France which was a line that people died about not very long ago, is now nearly invisible. There's, there's no apartheid in South Africa. The Soviet Union doesn't exist. People are so busy making money, they don't recognize the line between Taiwan and China anymore. But the lines between Multnomah and Clackamas and Washington County are as distinct today as they were in the year that they were drawn. They were drawn, incidentally, in the year before the telegraph was introduced to the Oregon Territory. And this was territory, because it was five years before statehood. Well, we're not using telegraphs anymore. If we're going to knit together that lively city region with all three of those counties, with all 24 of those cities, all of them working together we can only do so by nurturing that investment that I talked about, investment in the financial and the human and the natural capital that we need to be successful. And we can only do that by working regionally. With hard work and with that partnership among jurisdictions and with the courage to innovate, just as the people in the 1970s had the courage to innovate, we can redeem that promise, the promise, promise of Oregon life. And it's a promise of lively towns, squares, and stable neighborhoods, and access to green spaces nearby. It's also a promise that allows us to have a well-paying job and build a business that thrives and to choose the kind of life for our families that we want to have. A lot of the last 30 years has proven we can, and that the peculiar and innovative experiments that add up to Oregon can also add up to fulfilling, living up to that promise. Well, now it is up to us to prove that we can fulfill that promise over the next 30 years. And if we can succeed at that, future generations will continue to treasure this city region and we'll say, we can have it all here. Thank you. Thank you, David. As you probably know, uh, City Club members have the privilege of asking questions of our guests. Our uh, first question today will come from our board host, Kurt Wabring. He's first vice president of the club and president of the research board, and he's also um, uh, head of Sextant Consultants, a planning and management consulting firm. Um, after Kurt's asked his question, City Club members uh, can approach the mic microphones and ask their questions. Please identify yourself as a club member and ask your question in uh, 30 seconds or less. 
bring out the question sign. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, Andy. Um, before my question, I want to underscore one of the announcements, which has to do with the community scan. Um, we're asking for ideas for uh, research topics as well as programs. And uh, for you in the radio and television audience, uh, you don't have to be a City Club member. We welcome ideas from everyone. And uh, you can get more information and input directly uh, on our website. Now, my question has to do with affordable housing. It's a problem throughout the region. <coughs> and. Um, and Metro currently asks cities to report uh, on 15 different strategies like density bonuses and um, foregoing uh, development fees uh, to produce uh, affordable housing. Um, but when it all comes down to it, even if one does many of those actions, there's still a problem of funding affordable housing. And so my question to you uh, David, is um, what's met your thinking and Metro's thinking on creating a regional uh, housing uh, fund, like a housing trust fund? Uh, Eric, did you want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> this is something that has been studied quite a bit and I think uh, is recognized now throughout the region, not certainly in just in the city of Portland, that this is a, an issue of, about our economic competitiveness. And certainly, for example, the, the, the city leaders in Hillsborough have been very clear about expressing the need to have affordable places where people in the high-tech industry uh, can live closer to, to their jobs. And that having the range of opportunity for people in the community, whether they're uh, starting out as school teachers or, or police officers, that you want to have that spectrum in the community. So I think there's, it's come a long way in terms of recognizing that as more than just sort of a social good, but as something very important for the economic uh, competitiveness of the region. We had a, a group that uh, consisted of a lot of different interests that studied all of this. And it, I think, in my opinion, it does come down to production, and it does come down to actually producing units, which is a question of revenue which is, uh, leads to a dead end often in this, in this state these days in terms of supplementing revenue for new programs when existing programs uh, are being, being reduced. So I, I agree with the, the underlying message in the question is that the, the production of housing is the paramount thing. In the meantime, I think the role of the Metro Council, we've been talking about this among ourselves and the type of organization we want to be, uh, going forward vis-a-vis -vis the other service providers in the region, whether they're housing authorities in this uh, case or uh, general purpose governments in, in other cases, that simply having uh, ourselves be a repository of uh, having t telling jurisdictions to fill out reports and send them in and we'll make sure we, you know, we file them and staple them in the right place is not uh, necessarily very helpful to anybody. What would be better for us to be moving to be the type of organization where both our elected leadership is out dealing with our colleagues who are the other elected uh, officials as well as staff to staff relations in terms of providing technical expertise and in terms of, of helping coach people through, through problem solving uh, rather than just sort of fulfilling mathematical formulas. And I think that's what we're going to be endeavoring to do. Jennifer Chris Smith, Chris? club member. Uh, David, I think one of the things that Metro is not sufficiently celebrated for is the way it creates uh, regional partnerships. And I'm thinking of JPACT and MPACT uh, and their respective subcommittees and technical committees that do a remarkable job of bringing together local elected leaders from jurisdictions, technical staff, and stakeholders in a sometimes messy process, but one that achieves a remarkable degree of consensus uh, in land use planning and transportation, uh, makes us much more effective, for example, in lobbying the federal government for resources. Uh, you've pointed out that uh, the unit of economic competitiveness is the region, but our economic development agencies are at the state level and at the city level. Is it time for Metro to create a regional partnership for economic development that can replicate the kind of success we've had in land use and transportation planning? No, I don't think it's time for the Metro Council to create something like that because something like that already exists and we're plugged into it, it now. I think 
this is a, a, an area of interjurisdictional cooperation that has come a long way over the last 18 months or, or two years uh, through uh, uh, interlocking relationships among jurisdictions. And I think there's a lot of leadership uh, at the staff level recognizing the interdependence and recognizing that these things are connected to one together. Uh, together. So I think there's a fairly good working relationship that is starting to develop. What has been missing from the equation from my point of view has been real policy direction about what the objectives of our regional economic development strategy are. And in the absence of that, I think there, there's, uh, there's not quite the direction that there needs to be. Uh, one of my critiques is I think there's been an overemphasis on recruitment when we already know that 80% of new jobs are created by businesses who are already here, and unless you're making it good for those people to be here, it's not worth uh, you know, chasing around after to get new people to come here. So I, uh, Mayor Drake, Mayor uh, Rob Drake of Beaverton chairs a, a policy committee that was actually snowed out in January, so we have not met this year. And the intent of that group is to shape the elements of the overall strategic direction. I think that's really what's been missing, but by bringing that group together, we can start to provide it. Just two days ago, uh, we were, we as a region, not as the Metro Council, I think it, PDC, Portland Development Commission is actually the uh, conduit for the funds, was awarded $75,000 from the uh, Federal Economic Development Administration to provide technical support for developing that uh, regional economic strategy. Let me just say finally, and you, as you mentioned other uh, committees, and you, at, we have a rule on our council, anybody using acronyms in a public meeting gets fined, but he said JPAC and MPAC, and for those of you who, it's Joint Policy Advisory Committee on Transportation and Metro Policy Advisory Committee, and those are local officials who get together once a month or twice a month um, to advise us. And whether it's uh, affordable housing or whether it's economic development strategy or, or whether it's transportation, uh, where I'm trying to get the organization is, is to is, is a place where we're thinking less about your turf and my turf and thinking more about how do we deliver products to the citizens who pay you know, all of our salaries. Senator Cease. I think he was before. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. He was kneeling down. He's, he's praying to Ed Washington, as I often did. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Roy Plan, right. a City Club member. Uh, it seems to me that for a better future, people would not have to compete for urban space with the automobile. And uh, the obvious alternative is a lot more regional rail. I wonder if uh, the metro organization is prepared to lead in that direction and provide uh, an impetus and funding for alter rail alternative. Well, I think we have made a lot of progress in this community in terms of the transit system, and I think the Metro Council has been a big part of that in the past. And going forward, uh, we will continue to be. We're working very closely in terms of rail <coughs> in particular on the Wilsonville-Beaverton line that uh, Chair Bryan has really spearheaded from its very early conception. And by having the Metro Council involved in that, I think we bring some resources, both federal dollars, but also uh, access to some of the technical people in Washington to, to, to do the advocacy for that, uh, as well as the twin lines to the south, uh, downtown Milwaukee and I-205. So uh, all of that is underway. Meantime, in Washington, where so many of these funds come from in the transportation realm, uh, they did pass a, a, a bill yesterday. There's a lot going on. There's the six-year reauthorization of federal funds. And so we've been trying to be uh, involved uh, in that. And again, having that regional consensus about it is very helpful because we no longer have a powerful congressional delegation back there like we once did. Senator. Ron Cease, I'm a member of the uh, City Club and I was chairman of the big commission in the 70s that put Metro together. So you don't have to convince me of the regional, the regional so, need. I can blame you. Uh, that goes back 20, 25 years. But let me ask you, um, Really, Deb, you were talking about two things. You were talking about the regions. You were also talking about a borderless world, but let's just stay with the region part of it for the moment. Give us a sense if, as a citizen, two years from now, four years from now, I'm looking at what Metro is doing when I'm uh, electing people or I'm looking at what the city is doing. What can we look for that would indicate that we are, as a region, moving in the direction you're talking about, which is 
in reference to policy and implementation. I would say parenthetically, as you know, we, unlike most of the regions of the country, we have more structure, I, mean, I shouldn't say more, we have better structure, and that doesn't suggest that we can't change some of that, but we're blessed with some of the things that have happened. But if we're going on to policy and implementation, what do we look for? Who takes the leadership? How do we know at some point that something is really happening, something specific? Sure. I'll give you a great specific. And let me say, for, uh, first, it's, it's all, not just a matter of what we'd be doing, but it's also a matter of how we'd be doing it. Okay. I think it'd be different in both of those respects. Example I want to give you is parks and green spaces, where I think this region really has some tremendous assets. I mean, just physically, it also fits very well with the lifestyle that people like to have here. And the Metro Council has made tremendous strides because the voters in 1995 provided $135 million worth of acquisition, which acquired those 8,000 acres that I mentioned in the talk. Well, now we're at the stage of what, how do we let you have some access and enjoy those 8,000 acres? How do we even just take care of the things we have? I mean, it's this basic maintenance question and some, you know, being a steward of, of public assets. If we look at that in isolation, we're really shortchanging the public as well as ourselves because each of those acres is in a jurisdiction or adjacent to a jurisdiction that has a parks department. Historically, that's not a service that there's been a lot of regional dialogue about in terms of actual implementation and delivering the service. Fact is, the person who's out there using the service really doesn't care. So we have this patchwork where Truly the most regional park in the region is a municipal park owned by the city of Portland called Forest Park, and 40% of the people using it come from outside the city limits of Portland based on their surveys. The regional parks that the regional government runs are actually two parks in far e east of Gresham and Fairview, Oxbow and Blue Lake. And the state, the biggest unit of government, a state park is, serves as uh, Tryon Creek as, as more of a neighborhood park. So you have a real mismatch of jurisdictional responsibilities in the actual properties. What we've undertaken in the last year with the new leadership and new direction at, at, at Metro is to engage in that discussion at a very practical level with the local governments, which is a financial issue for all of us, as well as just getting a better product, such that when we make the steps to turn Cooper Mountain, this 260 acres just southwest of Beaverton, a beautiful spot, I mean, views of, of the coast range. It's also a part of the region that has been underserved in terms of parks. But that when, when we do that, that Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District would be part of a management agreement. So they're already part of the planning. The city of Wilsonville is part of a 220 acre parcel uh, down in Wilsonville. Those jurisdictions wouldn't be able to do it alone. They wouldn't be able to do it without us, but we wouldn't be able to do it very well without them. So when it comes to actually implementing, you ask what it's gonna be like two or three years from now, I would hope that you could come to Cooper Mountain and maybe the sign would say Metro Council and Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District, not that you care. You care that it's a good place. And if you noticed uh, somebody taking the, you know, emptying the, uh, the trash cans, even though it's a Metro property, it might be the person who's got a pickup truck is from Tualatin Hills Park and Rec District because it makes no sense for me to send somebody from Oxbow Park to Cooper Mountain to empty the trash when they have somebody there. In terms of our expert, what we're looking at is quit talking about whose turf it is and th start talking about who's competent at what. And for us in this, in, in this arena, I think we've got a, some real strengths in terms of staff on environmental education, in terms of acquisition of real estate, and in terms of uh, stewardship of large sites. Those are all things that we have as technical uh, capabilities that the city of Gladstone doesn't have. Yet, when it comes to, you know, painting the stripes in a parking lot or fixing it, the, the park benches, they may be better at that than we are. So I think what you'll, you'll see ideally uh, is that type of service, that you'd go to Cooper Mountain, you'd have a good experience, and it's being provided by a consortium of agencies that are each doing what they do best. I appreciate that. And you just need to tell the public a little bit more about what people are doing in conjunction with each other, that is, the, the local governments. I think the public isn't aware of a good part of that. Yeah, but I mean, if we start providing a better product, that's, you get a lot more credit. If there's more credit to go around, then you all get more credit. 
Marcus. That, that clapping wasn't for me, David. <laughs> I'm Marcus. <laughs> Mar Marcus Samantha, City Club member, and I'll surprise you, David, I'm not going to talk about how important the agricultural industry is or farmland, the, how wonderful our that. soils are. Um, you talked about the region very intelligently, I think, and yet you didn't mention Clark County that I happened to catch. Uh, parts of Washington County are not included in the metro uh, legal boundaries, uh, North Plains, uh, banks, et cetera. When and how can Metro include the total region instead of the region it currently includes? Well, that's another area where I think, uh, you know, less focus on institutional turf and more focus on problem solving actually gets you a lot farther. Because we, we, we met recently with the Marion County Commission. I think it was the first time the Marion County Commission and the Metro Council had ever met and recognizing the influence we have on one another inadvertently. It's good to have sort of a conscious dialogue. But the first 30 minutes of it were us having to persuade them we didn't want to take over Marion County. You know, and we, with all due respect, we said, well, you know, we've got our hands full. You know, we're not looking to take over Marion County. Um, so I think that's part of it. You have to focus on particular projects and, and products where you have a mutual interest in being at the table. And uh, transportation is one, and that's one that we've really used as a, uh, a bridge, as it were, to the relationships with Clark County, which I think are a lot better than they were four or five years ago, um, just because of the recognition. I mean, I, as you can tell, I mean, I, I really believe self-interest is a good motivator, and that, that, that it, it, it's something we ought to recognize. And in that instance, is a recognition that, you know, having four senator, U.S. senators talk about the interstate system is sure a lot better than having two senators talk about it. And so the dialogue with Clark County has come much more around on, on the transportation projects, but that has led the way to establish relationships and dialogue about a lot of the other issues. And as we look at the industrial land supply now, we're talking to them about, well, what's going on with warehousing in Woodburn or uh, Ridgefield, and how does that affect what we're doing? So it, I think you can have a very productive relationship without formalizing you know, one jurisdiction kind of being the boss of somebody else. I think we have time for one more question over here. I think you were standing first. Hi, David. I'm Charles Hi. Wiggins, City Club member. Uh, thanks for a um, very uh, elegant vision of the metropolitan region. One of the things that you talked about was this shift from uh, process to outcome. And um, all of us appreciated the uh, nice people at the Court of Appeals as one of those examples. But one of the things that Metro and the metropolitan region is noted for is citizen participation processes. Uh, how do you see those processes fitting into your vision of a shift to outcome? And is there a role for citizens in monitoring and developing and evaluating the uh, outcomes that you're talking about? Yeah. Well, citizen involvement is one of the foundations not just of Oregon's land use system, but it's the foundation of democratic government in the United States. And recognizing that and plugging people in in a meaningful way is a challenge. We have under our charter, uh, like as most governments do, we have a citizen involvement committee and we use to sort of audit our procedures and as opposed to, uh, you know, have, did we have sufficient hearings about things like that. Um, what's clear to me is that the conventional ways of doing that aren't working. We aren't necessarily reaching people where they live and it's almost the more we do in the conventional ways, the more disaffected the average person seems to get. There's a real irony I haven't quite figured out about that. But I think it has to do with going more to where people are. We have pioneered um, some of that year before last in a series called Let's Talk, which was co-sponsored by one of the television stations as well as local businesses and, and uh, I think a chain of coffee shops that gave us space at their coffee shops to actually have these dialogues where our council and our staff were out having informal discussions asking the more complicated questions rather than expecting people to come see us at two o'clock on a Thursday afternoon and testify about some particular ordinance and you have three minutes thank you very much your time is up so trying to engage uh, in those unconventional ways I think going forward is going to be really important and we're looking at a lot of different different ways uh, to do that.
Well, on, on behalf of the club and our audience, I wanted to thank you, David, for so eloquently challenging us to think about new ways to redeem the Oregon promise. Thank you. City Club is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.